Hey guys, it's Greg. Welcome back to Supposedly Fun. I've had a bit of a feminist theme running through the videos that I've done this week, so I thought it would make sense to follow up on that today and pick up on a thread from my video yesterday uh, in which I briefly spoke about Meg Wallitzer's book, The Wife, and said that I thought it had some flaws that I might get to at a later time, and today is going to be that later time. And as an added bonus, I'm going to talk about two other books by Meg Wallitzer, The Female Persuasion and the interestings and i want to start with the interestings because this is the book that introduced me to meg wallitzer i read it when it first came out as you can see i got an advanced copy of it back when i used to be a member of amazon's vine program and i will say i do think i eventually would have discovered meg wallitzer on my own but it probably would have taken more time and it might not even have been this book and that is probably as much gratitude as you will ever hear me express toward amazon on this channel <laughs> But anyway, I love this book. It's about six teenagers who meet at a summer camp for the arts in the 1970s, and they call themselves the Interestings. It's meant as an ironic joke at their expense, but it also has this half hopeful vibe in that way teenagers have where they, they desperately want there to be something interesting about them. In just one of the many clever things about this novel, it works both ways. Um, in typical novel style, style, an outsider is our entry point into the book. Uh, that outsider is Jules. She is not an artist, she's not a privileged kid, and yet she ends up at this summer camp for artistic kids and privileged kids. Basically, her father had just gone through a really long, dragged out illness and died. And she wanted an escape from her family, so she ended up at the summer camp. Why she ended up at a summer camp for the arts is really unclear, and it's one of the nitpicky details I have with this book. Because it, it would be one thing if Meg Wallitzer explained that it was her only choice, but it's not. Um, and it would be another thing if it was clear that Jules was kind of similar to what the way they call themselves the Interestings. It, it, it would make sense if Jules was kind of hoping that there was something artistic about her that would fit in. But nothing else in the writing supports that idea. It's just me looking for an explanation. But really, when you get down to it, it's these nitpicky details that make or break a book by Meg Wallitzer for me. In the interestings, I think the rest of the book bears out the flaws, and you can go along with it. Um, but anyway, Jules finds her, does find her place in the art world as a comedian. She falls in love with performing and being funny and having people like her for being funny. And over the decades that follow... Most of the six interestings fade into the background, but we do get to hear about what they're up to. And that is where the interestings really takes off for me. What happens to the members of the interestings over the decades and the ways in which they grow up and either succeed or fail or change course in their lives and settle for things that they didn't expect to settle for, it feels remarkably organic and really true to life. It's quite possibly the best example of what it's like to grow up and ad adapt your dreams to reality that I've ever read in a novel. And because it's so good at that, it feels urgent and poignant. And also because of that, I'm willing to overlook any of the small parts that don't make much sense, or even the moments in which I find Wallitzer's descriptive style a bit odd. I won't really go into where their lives take them, over the years. I will say that one of the characters is clearly a reference to the person who created The Simpsons, and that arc is interesting as well. But I think part of this book's charm is watching what happens. I recommend this book. I love it. Based on how much I love The Interestings, I sought out more books by Meg Wallitzer, and I picked up the ebook of The Wife. Interestingly, and this was pure coincidence, I read it on a plane, and the novel is set entirely on a plane. So it's just one of those things that happened. I briefly talked about this book yesterday, but it bears repeating. This book is about a woman who dreamed of being a successful writer, but put her own aspirations to the side in order to help her husband realize his own dreams of being a successful writer. And part of that is because she saw how incredibly difficult it was going to be for her to be taken seriously within both the worlds of publishing and academia. So she funneled all of her ambitions through her husband, and it worked. He has just won the Nobel Prize for Literature, and as they board the plane for the ceremony, she begins to look back at what happened, and she's overcome with this rage that she's been suppressing for decades. That part of the book is captivating. The ways her anger and resentment festered over the years feel justified, and it's an interesting way to look at a woman's role in her husband's success. 
Uh, I remember hearing the author Stacey Schiff talk about how Vladimir Nabokov's wife was his most judicious editor, but she always made comments in pencil so she could go back and erase them, which would mean that nobody would know how much she helped shape her husband's work. Uh, she also destroyed their letters, and the end result is that we don't know how much or how little she influenced her husband. And I thought about that a lot as I was reading The Wife. Here's the thing. There's a twist in The Wife that I won't reveal here. Uh, I don't think it's surprising at all, given the build-up to it, but Wallitzer treats it like a twist, so I'll respect that. But the fact that it was not surprising makes it feel like the book deflates when it should explode. I also really didn't like the ending. I won't spoil it, but I really didn't like it. And that kind of soured the book for me, and it halted my progress through Wallitzer's backlist. Uh, I have not seen the movie yet, so I don't know if they stick with Wallitzer's ending or if they do something different. Frankly, I hope they do something different. That takes us to The Female Persuasion, which came out last year, and I was really excited for this book. It was like event publishing for me. But I had a huge struggle with this book. Here's what happened. Like I said, this was event publishing for me, so I got on the wait list for it at my local library really early, which means I got a copy of it very close to the release date. But in the two weeks that I had the book, I only read 50 pages. I thought that the sense of urgency to return the book would light a fire in me to get through it, and it didn't. I kept it for another couple of days, and I only got about 20 pages in. I couldn't really put a finger on why I was struggling so much, but I really wasn't that into the book, and I felt defeated, um, and I returned it. All I could define at the time was that I really was not into Wallitzer's descriptive style at all this time around. There's a moment in the opening where the main character, Greer, walks into a room at her college, and she describes the smell of the room by using a chemical name, and then awkwardly defines that chemical name as the butter from movie theater popcorn. And you could argue that at this point in her life, Greer is smart but insecure about how smart she is and wants to show off how smart she is. And that's why she uses a chemical name instead of just saying it smelled like movie theater popcorn. <laughs> Except Greer's not doing first person narration. Wallitzer is the person who awkwardly defines what that chemical name is. And there really isn't anything else in the writing that would support this idea that that's what Greer is doing. It's just me looking for an explanation. And this happens a lot in the book, and it bothered me every single time. But anyway, I returned to the book, and I put myself on a waitlist for the audio version instead, because I thought the audio would help me power through the book, if nothing else. And I waited four months, and when it became available, I dove in again. And this time, I managed to breeze through the, through the first half of the book. The perspective shifts from Greer to her boyfriend, Corey. Again, not first person, but the, the main focus shifts from her to him. And then it shifts again to Greer's friend, Z. And that's where I got lost again, because it feels like the book is completely starting over again. And when we move from Greer to Corey... It feels relatively effortless because their stories are so intertwined that you can move from one to the other without a lot of backtracking. But when Z takes over the story, you have to go back to the beginning to explain her life until she got to college, her perspective on meeting Greer, and where she goes from there. It thwarted all of the momentum that I had built up and my interest drained away and that I, I didn't really know what to do and I was frustrated, I wasn't getting through the book. So I checked in with a friend and she told me that that basically happens two more times. The perspective shifts from somebody else and it essentially starts over. And that got me thinking about the interestings. How it managed to balance six characters without feeling like it was starting over constantly. And that was the light bulb moment for me because I realized something. It reminded me so much of the interestings. I felt like I'd already read it, but done better. Greer is basically a cheap imitation of Jules from The Interestings. Um, I mean, think about it. They both start out as insecure, directionless girls and progress from there to become women. It's essentially the same narrative, and I don't think there are enough twists that make it feel fresh in The Female Persuasion. Part of me wants to finish this book, but I don't think the third time would be the charm. Go figure. So I think I'm just going to leave it be and hope for better in the future. Anyway, that's it for today. 
If you've read any books by Meg Wallitzer, let me know. If you, are there other books of hers that I should try? Or do you disagree with me about the female persuasion? I'm open to listening to that. Or maybe you just want to gush about the interestings with me. I would love to do that as well. Um, anyway, like I said, I will not be here tomorrow, but I will be back. And I have an idea for the video I'm going to do next. I think it's going to be fun. So if you're interested, subscribe. And until then, happy reading. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe watch another video or leave me a comment. If you have recommendations or other things that you'd like to see, please let me know. I would love to hear it.